Hey everyone, Natalie here from the Pendulum's Path. If you need guidance, direction, spiritual connection, or more, then listen up. I have worked as a psychic and a medium for over three years, connecting people from all over the world with their loved ones in spirit, giving them insight and guidance into their current situations, the past healings that need to be worked on, and what it is they need to know today in order to have a better future. It would be my absolute honor if you would visit my website at www.thependulumspath.com. I also offer emailed readings for those with busy schedules too. Also, for you goblins who subscribe to the Esoteric Book Club, I have a special coupon code just for you. Enter the code STAYWEIRD to get $5 off of any order of $25 or more. Hope to see you there. In the 1970s, Mary was an American exchange student living in Oslo, Norway. One September evening, she had gone to dinner with some of her friends, and, when she left the restaurant, it was pretty late at night. She went to the tram platform to catch the last train before it shut down for the evening. She stood alone in the open air, and she passed the time by looking at the surrounding scenery. That's when she noticed that the wind had suddenly stopped blowing and an eerie calm had fallen over the area. A few hundred meters down the tracks, a massive form rose up from within the forest to loom over the treetops. It turned its head to look at her, nodded in greeting, and slowly waved its left hand. Mary stood there in stunned silence for three minutes, just staring at this massive creature that should not exist. It could not exist. And yet, there it was, standing taller than the tallest tree. As the tram appeared over the horizon, the spell was broken. When the lights fell on the area where the creature stood, it suddenly vanished into thin air. The wind, again, began to blow as the tram slowed to a stop at the platform. Mary went home that night and recorded the event in her journal. She normally wrote in English, being that it was her native language, but when she got to the last line, she wrote it in Norwegian. Tonight, it said, I experienced a troll. I'm your host, Jason, and you're listening to the Esoteric Book Club. Welcome back, goblins. Tonight, we are delving into the book, Trolls, An Unnatural History, by Professor John Lindau. Before we get started, I want to take a moment to thank the members of the Esoteric Archive. Annie K., Kylie H., Soul Rising Studios, and Grand Inquisitor Samantha. Members of the Esoteric Archive get early access, extended episodes, shout-outs on the show, and a warm, tingly sensation that may just be your skin slowly turning to stone as the first rays of the sun peek over the horizon. Looks like it's time to get back to your cave. If you would like to join the archive, go to patreon.com forward slash esoteric book club. All proceeds go towards reading materials, server costs, and keeping my blood to coffee ratio in balance. But enough about that, you want to hear about the book. So, let's get weird. So I have to confess, this is not the first book that I read for this month's episode. I completed another book of comparable length and was so thoroughly frustrated with it that I won't even mention it here by name. Why was it so bad? Well, let me summarize the entire thesis of this book for you. What if all those Bigfoot tracks with only three or four toes weren't really Sasquatch, but were in fact giants? That's basically it. I have summarized the entire book for you. There's a little bit more detail, but really, not all that much. The authors, yes, there were two of them, 
proposed that these tracks were made by a different species of hairy hominid that descended from Gigantopithecus. They cite the extremely limited quantity of Gigantopithecus fossils to demonstrate that, as a species, it didn't readily fossilize, so we can't determine with any accuracy how far it spread throughout the ancient world. So rather than use supporting evidence, they are using the lack of evidence to create plausible deniability. As an aside, I did a very quick Google search, and Gigantopithecus fossils have only been found in southeastern Asia. What I found more fascinating is that they are frequently found in caves, and often found with gnaw marks by rodents. The current theory is that the bones are taken into the caves and snacked upon by ancient porcupines. They couldn't chew the hard enamel, which is why most of the remains of Gigantopithecus that we have are from their teeth. Long story short, they are only found in Asia. I couldn't even salvage any stories from this book. The first-hand reports were told with such brevity that they were virtually non-stories. Essentially, they boiled down to, I was in the jungle one day, and I turned around and saw a 20-foot-tall hairy giant. It screamed. I screamed. We both ran away. The end. Since these stories don't really make for good podcasting, I had to switch directions completely, and I reread the book Trolls, An Unnatural History. I had read this book when it was first released, and I remember it being quite good, so I picked it back up for this podcast. Trolls is of comparable length to the aforementioned unnamed book, but the quality of the material is exponentially better. It just goes to show how much content, and conversely how little content, you can fit into 150 pages. To start, let's take a look at the book's author. Dr. John Lindau is a professor emeritus of Old Norse and folklore at the University of California, Berkeley. He graduated from Harvard University with a Ph.D. in Germanic languages and literature. He began teaching in 1972, is a member of the Royal Gustavus Adolphus Academy, which is a Swedish royal academy dedicated to the study of Swedish folklore, and was awarded the Knight's Cross of the Royal Order of the Falcon for his contributions to Icelandic medieval literature. His specializations are in Old Norse religion, literature, and in Scandinavian, Sami, and Finnish mythology. This is nowhere near being his first published book, but it is one of his most recent. Trolls was published in 2014 by Reaction Books. That's Reaction with a K because England. It is currently available in both hardback and paperback versions, with the paperback already into its second print run. I checked out what other titles Reaction Books has in their mythology section and found quite a few promising ones. For example, Basilisks and Beowulf, Monsters in the Anglo-Saxon World. Trick or Treat, The History of Halloween. Fairies, A Dangerous History and Echoes of Valhalla. If any of these sound interesting to you, email me at jason at esotericbookclub.org and I'll see if I can get them for future episodes. Now, the story I told in the introduction was relayed to Lindau directly by one of his acquaintances. She was unnamed in the book, so I gave her the moniker of Mary because it would otherwise have been an awkward retelling of the events. Lindau, being a linguist, found it fascinating that this event took place when Mary was reconciling her American culture with the progression of her Scandinavian culture. He saw the transition from English to Norwegian as a way to show this transition from one mindset to another. Not only this, 
But when Mary told her Norwegian friends about it the next day, they didn't ridicule her or try to convince her that she had not seen what she believed. They took it at face value. They accepted it. It was simply an uncanny event, and the only person who truly knew what took place was Mary. This doesn't mean that they didn't believe her, though. Trolls are so intrinsically tied to Scandinavian culture and mindset that it isn't even really seen as outside the norm. Of course, trolls aren't necessarily what the rest of the world thinks they are. To get an idea of what they are, we need to look at how the word troll is used. First and foremost, we really don't know the origin of the word troll. We don't know what language it stems from, nor what the original meaning was. What's weird is that it doesn't seem to refer to an entity when we first see it being used in literature. It indicates the presence of magic or enchantment, but by way of being affected by a troll. So we don't hear about the troll itself, but instead we hear about it indirectly through its actions. Another aspect of the word which only a linguist would notice through translation, is that it's not a gendered word, meaning that it doesn't have a masculine or feminine aspect. This doesn't mean that trolls themselves are gender neutral. In fact, they are far from it, as we will hear later. It simply means that the word itself is an oddity amidst gendered language systems. There are also variations of the word, such as trilla, found in Old Norse, which means to turn into a troll. Basically, the word has been used as a noun, verb, adverb, adjective, pretty much any way that you can think to associate something else with trolldom. In modern usage, it typically evokes the idea of magic specifically natural or nature-based magic, shape-shifting, or of unusual size. That said, trolls as entities are rather hard to describe. They are extremely varied in their appearance, so the easiest way to categorize them is by what they are not. They are not human. They are not normal. And they are anything but helpful. As recorded in a poem from the Orkney Isles in 1200 AD, it is said, All exaggerations seem short. Not much is worse than a troll. What's really weird is that the first time we encounter a troll in literature, it is from someone who's claiming to be a troll. It comes from a poem about a poet who is traveling through some woods. He is accosted by an unseen person, and they fight using poetry. Trolls call me moon of the dwelling rung near, giant's wealth sucker, storm sun's bale, seeress's friendly companion, guardian of corpse fjord, swallower of heaven's wheel. What is a troll other than that? To which the poet, named Bragi, replies, Poets call me Vidor's thoughtsmith, getter of God's gift, lack not hero, server of Eeg's ale, song-making Modi, skilled smith of rhyme. What is a poet other than that? Granted, this is all in translation from Old Norse and uses a type of poetic style called a kenning, where you don't directly talk about a thing, but you talk about aspects of that thing, leaving the listener to infer the meaning. If I were to edit this for modern English, it would sound something like this. Epic rap battles of history! Broggy the poet versus troll woman! Fight! Trolls call me the color of night, defiler, tempest bringer, psychic's ghostly friend, 
watcher of the graveyard, devourer of men. What is a troll other than that? Poets call me God's gift, Odin's silver tongue. Songsmithing, rhyme spitting, shade thrower, mic blower, I am number one. What is a poet other than that? That's right. Poets in Viking Scandinavia had rap battles. There is also this weird tradition in Scandinavian poetry of reciting names to gain some sort of recognition or clout. This is called a thuler. Later in this larger poetic work, we get a thuler of trolls, including names like Asshole, Hard Grip, and Shaggy Fingers. None of which are very complimentary, especially considering that these names are mostly for troll women. That's another clue to the defining characteristics of trolls. It seems, at least in historical use, trolls and giants, the Jotnar specifically, are the same entity, but the word troll is usually used for female creatures and the word giant for the males. This isn't a hard and fast rule, and it tends to be less defined as time progresses. But at least early on, this was the way that the word was used. As time progressed, trolls became more convoluted with demons through the Christian conversion of Scandinavia. This is probably based on their unpleasant demeanor, their tendency to enchant people, and their close association with the underworld. This description seems a bit unfair, considering that historically, trolls had close ties to natural cycles, including the cycle of both life and death. On top of that, they don't necessarily seem to be predatory or vicious, but more opportunistic. Sure, there's accounts of trolls ambushing people, but they tend to be easily outwitted or outmaneuvered. The point is, as Scandinavian culture changed, so did the trolls. Eventually, there is a shift from stories of trolls raiding farmsteads, stealing sheep, and drinking ale, to them casually walking up to farmers and asking to barter with them. These encounters generally end in one of two ways. The farmer refuses and they are plagued by natural disasters, or they make a trade and they are blessed with good fortune. This starts to lend more credence to the idea that trolls are more like nature spirits than they are biblical demons. But things change. With the conversion of Scandinavia, the stories of trolls transition from being mythological figures to being villains in fairy tales. No longer are they symbolic forces of nature that have to be overcome or bargained with. Now they are symbols of sin, slovenly, dim-witted, lustful, and greedy. They live outside of human society, as they always have, but now they are barely more than animals. And, of course, being fairy tale creatures, they can talk. Because in fairy tales, all animals can talk. This is where we start to see the recurring theme that most of us know from Jack and the Beanstalk. fee fi fo fum I smell the blood of a Christian man. This repetitive phrase is best known in relation to a giant, but its origins come from stories of trolls. These creatures have always been the other, but now that concept wasn't just applied to strangers or other cultures. Now it was applied to other religions, or in the case of trolls, the lack thereof. The fact that trolls are described as being able to smell Christian blood has a twofold effect. First, it makes them seem even more base and animal like. Humans can't track by scent, after all, only animals can. Second, it elevates conversion to something magical that fundamentally changes the convert on a physical level, not just a spiritual one. It reinforces the idea that Christians are fundamentally different from the world around them. Enough so that they even smell different. 
These changes in the overarching narrative reshape the purpose of the troll. These creatures no longer go on nighttime raids to collect provisions. Now they go out to cause destruction, mayhem, and occasionally kidnapping. We also see a transition away from the primarily female troll to them being almost exclusively male. Thus, the kidnapping in stories is almost always of human women. For some reason, troll men seem to be fond of beautiful princesses, even if those princesses live and work on a farm, which is highly suspect for a member of the royal family. I find the whole idea dubious, and I think the term princess may just be a stand-in for the prettiest girl in town, but I digress. So while trolls now embody every bad action that mankind can take, they are easily, and frequently, overcome through cunning and the bare minimum amount of faith. Most of the time, they are tricked by children, which probably is meant to demonstrate how innocence can defeat malevolence. But to me, it just makes the trolls seem even more dim-witted. I don't want to get too bogged down in the symbolism of the troll and its place in fairy tales and Christianity. We've already covered most of the highlights, so let's move on to examine how the appearance of trolls has changed with their transition from mythology to fairy tales. In mythology, trolls are usually described as being black, or having coloration like the dead, slimy with dripping snot, and bigger than humans. Most of the time. Apparently, in southern Sweden, they are no bigger than a half-grown child. Think of the trolls from the Frozen franchise, and you're on the right track. But, by and large, trolls were both monstrous and magical. They could entroll people, animals, or objects, which is pretty much a general term for troll magic. Think of it like how fairies have their own unique magic system. It's kind of like that. Troll magic usually involves shape-shifting into animals, or in extreme cases, turning humans into trolls, or generally affecting the luck of an area, either for good or ill. This can range from making household objects disappear to making crops fail. It really depends on how much you've upset the troll. Overall, though, trolls looked and behaved in a relatively human fashion. They were just ugly and tended to avoid living in human settlements. When we shift to the era of the fairy tale, though, things changed dramatically. Let me ask you a question. How many heads does a troll have? Trolls, like many fairy tale creatures, are not exactly set in their physical appearance. There is more of a general set of guidelines that are used to shape their forms. Now that you've had a moment to think about it, what's your answer? How many heads does a troll have? One? Two? A dozen? In this instance, the answer is simply yes. Trolls are monstrous, and to better define that, they can have multiple heads. What's odd is that after the first three heads, they tend to grow in multiples of three. So it goes like one, two, three, then six, nine, twelve. In literature, we only see a single troll with twelve heads, and that is the king of the trolls. If you look at stories in which multi-headed trolls are featured, there tends to be a lot of infighting amongst themselves. So more heads means more disputes. Any troll who can survive long enough to grow 12 heads, that all generally get along with each other, would absolutely be considered the king. Besides extra heads, trolls are often depicted with exaggerated facial features, such as long noses or floppy ears, or even in extreme cases, animal ears. Additionally, if you look at old block prints, you will often see trolls depicted with peg-like teeth usually with gaps between them. They could also have a tail. 
Their tails could vary from looking like a cow's tail to something more like a rat. Much like the use of animal ears, I think the tail is often a physical trait that is used to denote a specific character trait. For example, a cow's tail would indicate that a troll had, let's say, limited intelligence. Finally, a troll's eyes are sometimes featured, but they are often just used as a descriptive element. They could be fiery pinpoints of light, or, in one famous tale, as big and round as saucers. I'll go ahead and tell that story since some of you may not have heard it before. There once was a bridge that spanned a river connecting two fields. Beneath this bridge lived a monstrous troll with large hairy arms and eyes as big as silver platters. He jealously guarded the bridge and demanded a toll from anyone who wanted to cross. When someone would approach, he would reach up with one of his hairy arms and block the path. Pay the toll or I'll gobble you up, he would demand. Oftentimes, people would just give him something to eat and he would allow them to cross the bridge in peace. One day, a small goat noticed that the grass on the other side of the bridge was much, much greener. It looked delicious, so he started to cross the bridge. Suddenly, a large hairy arm crashed down in front of him. Pay the toll, or I'll gobble you up. The poor goat was stunned. He didn't have anything to pay the toll with, and he certainly didn't want to be gobbled up. You don't want to eat me, Mr. Troll. I'm all skin and bones. If you wait, my brother will be along soon. He's much bigger than me. Now, the troll was not dumb. He knew that a bigger goat meant a bigger meal. This goat was pretty small, after all. He was little more than a snack. Okay, you can cross. But next time, you'll have to pay, or else I'll gobble you up. Thank you, Mr. Troll said the goat as he scampered across the bridge. About an hour later, a goat with short spiky horns started to cross the bridge when, boom, a large hairy arm blocked his path. Pay the toll or I'll gobble you up. This goat was bigger, but he was still no match for a troll. Much like his little brother, he was a quick thinker though. You don't want to eat me, Mr. Troll. I would be too tough. I'm not even fully grown, he said, trying to make himself look even smaller than he was. If you wait just a little while longer, my father will be along, and he is a big, strong billy goat. The troll thought about it a moment, and he realized that if he waited, he could get himself a nice big meal. Okay, you can cross. But next time, you'll have to pay, or else I'll gobble you up. With that, the short-horned goat crossed the bridge. About an hour later, a big goat with long, curving horns began to cross the bridge when, boom, a large hairy arm blocks his path. Pay the toll, or else I'll gobble you up. This goat was not like the others, though. He was not afraid of the troll. You'll get no toll from me, and if you think you can gobble me up, well, I'd like to see you try. This must be a big goat, thought the troll. It's time to eat. With a mighty heave, the troll pulled himself atop the bridge with his large, hairy arms. The billy goat stomped his hoof, lowered his head, and charged forward with his long, curling horns. He struck the troll right in the stomach, and the troll went flying off the side of the bridge and into the river below. As the water carried away the troll, the last billy goat crossed to the other side of the bridge. After that day, 
no one ever had to pay a toll on that bridge again. This is my telling of the story, though the themes remain the same as in the originals. Granted, there are quite a few versions of this tale, but they all have the same elements. A bridge, a troll, and three goats of ever-increasing size. What I want to highlight are the hairy arms and the large eyes, which were emphasized in the original. This shows how the transition from mythology to fable has tamed these creatures. They are no longer magical entities closely associated with the dead, but they are now lumbering oafs more akin to ogres than they are to witches. We see a similar transition in Ireland with the Fae and the conversion to Christianity, although that is a story for another time. Let's take a moment to talk about the book itself. I had read it when it was first published, and I remembered enjoying it quite a bit. Rereading it, I still enjoyed it, but I was reminded that some of the chapters were less entertaining than others. I've highlighted the better parts in this episode, but I do want to forewarn you that there are sections that aren't as enjoyable. At least, they weren't for me. For example, when you get to the section on fairy tale trolls, there is a lot of discussion on authors, publication, and trolls in art. While the information is good, the chapter sometimes gets pretty dry. At its worst, it becomes more like a summary of an author's works. It's interesting, and would be excellent for a research project, but it's not exactly show material. The good news is that the slower parts are only a small portion of this book. So in summary, do I recommend this book? That is a tricky question. Not everyone is going to enjoy it. I did because I'm a huge folklore and mythology nerd. But other people may enjoy rereading the actual stories instead. If you enjoy learning about the origins and evolution of a mythological creature and its impact on modern society, then yes, I would recommend it. Otherwise, you may want to track down the works of the 19th century folklorist Peter Christian Bjornsson. He is probably the best known source for trolls in folklore and fairy tales. So if you want to get yourself a copy of Trolls, An Unnatural History by John Lindau, there will be a link in the show notes. The Esoteric Book Club can be found on Facebook, Instagram, Patreon, and at esotericbookclub.org. Intro and outro music is from the song Fight Don't Fight and is used courtesy of Sarah Rudy and her band Hello June. You can find more of their work at bandcamp.com or at wearehellojune.com. Archive members, stick around for some more weird stories. For the rest of you, until next time, remember, stay weird. Alright, you extra special weirdos, it's time once again to open the Esoteric Archive. Remember what I said about trolls having super weird appearances in fairy tales? I'm going to tell you one of their stories which depicts a troll's features as a narrative device. Beyond multiple heads, there are a few facial features that tend to crop up in stories about trolls.